Hello, everyone, and welcome to Voices of Computer Science lecture. In this lecture, I interview people working with computer sciences in many different ways to show you the diversity of topics, stories, and ways of thinking in your field. Today, I will talk to Olaf Witowski. Olaf is now the director of research at Cross Labs, a research student in Japan that studies the fundamental principles of intelligence. Olaf has also co-founded several ventures in science and technology, and today he's a board director of the International Society for Artificial Life. Hello, Olaf, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Hi, Klaus, I'm happy to be here. What's the most exciting thing that you're working with right now that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Thing that is exciting. So many things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's good you... to hear. <laughs> so I guess the, the main thing would be uh, understanding intelligence. Uh, the most exciting maybe is uh, the, the notion of uh, augmentation of uh, human intelligence. Augmentation, to, uh, okay. Understand, uh, I guess, um, what can extend our ability to solve problems in general. Um, the difference between, well, an agent, the mind and the body of an agent, uh, such as ourselves, humans or others, um, and the tool uh, that would be separate. And some tools augment our abilities and some uh, used, um, are used as offload of computation. And I guess, the, yeah, as a result, uh, I try to think about those notions in terms of computer science, but also we try to build uh, those tools with uh, AI and artificial life um, to extend the, the, the intelligence of, uh, of an agent. That's really interesting. I mean, when you talk about extending the intelligence, augmenting the intelligence, you're talking like how computers could be used to augment the intelligence of people. Is that the idea? Because you also mentioned agents, you also mentioned people. Uh, and I see, I mean, people, the students are might have be used to like augmenting intelligence as in science fiction, where you put a chip in your head, but I think we're not quite there yet. So when you talk about augmenting mm -hmm. intelligence, what are you thinking about? Yeah, I guess uh, there is no real limit. So I, mm -hmm. there, there are many tools and we want to yeah. study uh, all of them in the same, the same <laughs> uh, mathematics or the same science. Uh, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking about two examples, maybe uh, one example is Google Maps. Google uh -huh. Maps uh, right. is a, a tool, right? The smartphone is helping you uh, to find your way. And by following the instructions, uh, you actually augment your intelligence. You are able to find your way faster and easier. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this tool kind of offloads some of your computation. So yeah. the smartphone does it. The other example of tool is something, so it's great. This tool is great, right? Because you can form AI, you can have an artificial form of life that uh, helps you. So, so, uh -huh. uh, so that's, that's great. But there is another type of tool that is uh, something like, um, I would say an, an abacus or uh, something like a, a tool that extends something like the, the, the cane of a blind person. Uh, uh, or those kind of tools augment really your intelligence in a different way. Uh, you really perceive through the tool uh, reality in a different way. You, the cane allows you to perceive things differently. Uh, maybe there are some devices that you can uh, that make uh, makes you see um, more colors, or uh, maybe makes you see for blind blind people. There are some devices that allow them to see based on sound or other things. Um, so those devices extend your way. And, and to, to see reality in a different way, but there are still tools. And we, I, I want to understand the difference between those. And of course, one example of those tools is mathematics or <laughs> science, that's also a tool. Right, I find it really interesting, your example of the cane, because we usually don't think like a cane or a tool as a method to extend the intelligence. But when you talk about that, that's like really true. If you have, mm -hmm. if you think of, you start thinking of Google Maps and that's really clear because Google is thinking for you. And then you have maybe like a Google Glass because it puts new things in your vision. So, and then you have a cane because it lets you reach other places and things like that. And all of this, they start to like put together something, okay, but what is intelligence? Where is intelligence? How is intelligence? Which when I went to your site, I went back to the crossroads site and was like, okay, we're studying the fundamental principles of intelligence. So could you tell a little bit about, I guess that to augment intelligence, you have to understand it. So could you tell me what is 
studying the fundamental principles of intelligence? Yeah, the, so I guess when, when I say something like with the cane, it's the notion of embodied intelligence. Yeah. That, that uh, your body or anything that, that is around and plug on, plugged onto you is part of this intelligence. It helps you, makes it more likely that the problems that you have facing mm -hmm. in life uh, are going to be solved. You make it more probable. Uh, the, it's easier, I think, to, to think of it as what would be, uh, what would be stupidity. <laughs> and if you think of that, then mm. stupidity is something that makes it very improbable <laughs> that you will solve your problems. So uh, that makes you more stupid. But so, so we want the opposite of that, right? Something that extends the number of options that you have, that empowers you. And that's, I think, one big definition of intelligence. But there are so many other ones, yes. right? So, so that's, that's, I think, when you study intelligence, you have to realize there are so many. There are some mm -hmm. papers that actually list those. Oh. Uh, and But I think that, in general, it's always about something like uh, increasing the capacity to um, best uh, physically, so and with your body, compute and, and the brain or anything around you is part of this body. Uh, it's, and you can feel it's part of your body too, or not. Maybe you have the illusion that it's not part of your body, but it is. Mm -hmm. uh, to physically compute somehow your, your own continued existence, mm -hmm. right? So how to, and I think that's the basics. And from there, we go into many directions. But uh, so, so wait, I'll say that again. So, so the capacity yeah. to best physically compute your continued existence. I, I really like this, like capacity to compute your continued existence because we start to have like many other questions. So what is existence? And before you're saying our intelligence is the capacity of solving problems. So how do you define a problem? How do you mm -hmm. define your body? So I, I feel like, all these philosophical questions, they are really, really interesting. Do you, do you have anyone like in your research group right now that is like a, with a philosophy background that helps you with these sort of discussions? Yeah, actually, uh, several of us are interested in philosophy. Okay. Uh, but although we interact with philosophers, there is no one right now in my group that is a philosopher. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we are a very small group. We are slowly uh -huh. growing. But, uh, okay. But yeah, we... In a way, I consider myself and some of us do do, do that as well as, as philosophers because right. we are we work with physical systems, mm -hmm. uh, even if they are simulated, they're physical systems. Uh -huh. And and we work in meta physical systems and in, right. in uh, those possible like they're not real, but they what would happen if this happened, right? Mm -hmm. So this kind of artificial uh, artificial life kind of approach that means that we are meta physicists. Uh, so in a way we are philosophers but we are we should be more honest about it <laughs> yeah 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 no, i really like that so i'm gonna go back a little bit and mm. we talked a lot about intelligence and how your research mm. works about augmenting intelligence and helping people solve more problems and we talk a little bit about the definition of intelligence mm. now your phd topic was about collective intelligence. And I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about what is collective intelligence and how does it re how does it connect to your current study of like augmenting intelligence and I mean that we are targeting humans. So what's the connection between human intelligence and collective intelligence? But okay. maybe start with defining collective intelligence. Yeah, again, <laughs> defining is tricky, but I okay. guess when we say uh, collective intelligence, we mean that this intelligence would emerge from the interaction of different parts uh, in the system. So think of uh, different atoms that collide with each other, but somehow compute together. Think of a flock of uh, birds or birdoids uh, or of robots that uh, by interacting with each other, uh, compute more than what they could uh, alone or even individually by distributing. Right? It's not only distributing, it's really the interaction of it. So uh, by distributing mm -hmm. and computing together. Um, and I guess it's uh, the, the, the thesis uh, was um, focused on the emergence of really a sort of language between mm -hmm. them because it's intuitively what it leads you to, right? So you would have a bunch of agents and somehow by interacting with each other, um, they have to build or a, a protocol has to emerge such that 
they are able to solve this problem now together instead of just doing it in their their own way separately. Uh, so so I looked at different systems that um, that try to uh, that, that tend to show this kind of effect. And we found very surprising things that happen in very simple simulations, basically. And they rely on building something like a language. Wow. Uh, I, like this relationship be between language and collective intelligence is something very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Because I think there are a lot of people that approach language as something that one agent or one AI learns. Mm -hmm. And like these this this connection okay language is something that a bunch of a, a collective develops to improve its capacity to solve problems is is also an interesting perspective mm -hmm. yeah i think yeah a lot of uh, scientists i think uh, focusing on the language is, is yeah. a good start you shouldn't focus just on the language of the, the properties of the language but really how it interacts with uh, with the different layers of organization right with the embodied creatures mm -hmm. and i think that is the the center I yeah I had yeah I had for a long time that's that's one of my hobbies uh, oh. <laughs> learning languages uh, really and so so I I, I learned to speak a, a bunch of them uh, how, how many languages do you speak just going on a little bit outside right well right now just just five six but uh, I I used to be able to speak maybe ten twelve oh wow like that. yeah that's that's a lot <laughs> but you tend to forget those things yeah. We talked a little bit about augmentation and intelligence and definition of intelligence. And that's like a pretty big field of like um, augmented intelligence. What would you list as to be like the main open questions in your research right now? What are the questions that people are trying very hard to solve mm -hmm. and are not quite solved yet? Mm -hmm. Well, apart from what is intelligence. Right. Uh, that one goes the, without the... saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you could ask next about whether it is distributed mm -hmm. uh, and maybe all intelligence is uh, is distributed in a way because uh, uh, because of the, the the way physics is is uh, is uh, uh, the laws of physics exists or mm -hmm. or or are known uh, to us and uh, just it would be very difficult for one particle uh, to compute on its own, so it has mm -hmm. to exchange. So, so it's always going to be about how this information is uh, in the computational definition, physical computation uh, way of understanding information. This information is being transferred and transformed through different flows. And this is in order for uh, some result to happen, for some problem to be solved. And the most basic problem I think there is, is to make stuff replicate and adapt to new situations. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, these are the problems that we face in basic artificial life simulations. Uh, I really like that one. What there, do you there, mean? What do you yeah. mean by making stuff replicate in artificial life simulators? So you would have patterns. Uh, yeah. it's, it's something that looks like a cell, or, mm -hmm. or uh, it doesn't have to look like a cell, but but it has the features of uh, a cell. Even if if we are using um, ficti fictitious physics, if it's not mm -hmm. the laws of physics, but you are in a cellular automaton mm -hmm. uh, or one of those video games, uh, it could be very abstract or very concrete. It could be uh, any of those in 3D or more dimensions. Uh, sometimes 2D is, is sufficient. In those fictitious worlds, you could have some pattern that exists and maintain itself. D this information maintains itself through time. Mm -hmm. And in order to maintain itself, maybe it has to change a part of itself, maybe some kind of memory. Uh, and that's what we're studying. We want to know how the memory is going to change uh, and what processes are necessary in this, uh, in this whole pattern such that this pattern is going to uh, either replicate or remain the same, uh, keep a per part stable over time and build basically this a uh, long tree in time of uh, of maybe something that will become more diverse, mm -hmm. but has one lineage that you can track. And that is, uh, so even for this very simple problem, you can encounter already many interesting properties around it. How it does uh, transfer information within itself, with others perhaps. Um, and usually in those kind of systems, you can also see uh, 
uh, different transitions in evolution, right? Mm -hmm. So I would have to explain a bit more, but basically looking a bit uh, yeah. like the transitions of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you can, can talk a little bit more about those transitions. Yeah, I guess the, the transitions I'm talking about are the ones uh, discovered by uh, people called Maynard Smith and uh, mm -hmm. Seth Harry. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was in a paper in 1995. Uh, very, very fun. Uh, they classified in seven, I think, or eight, depending on how you count, uh, major transitions through which life went. And the okay. first one was just building a basic replicator. Mm -hmm. So just a bunch of molecules that would just by existing in the right medium would replicate themselves and make another copy, another copy, another copy. And that's the first stage. And then you have a bunch of other stages like uh, developing photosynthesis. Uh, you have many of those uh, non-major transitions too, right? Like building, like uh, developing wings or mm -hmm. uh, different features, um, organizing yourself in a eukaryotic cell or uh, multicellular organisms, those are different uh, transitions. So once you get to that transition, all of a sudden, the laws of how life functions, the laws of local physics are changing. So that means that in that place, uh, in evolution, uh, at that uh, slice of time, uh, all of a sudden, you have switched to a different kind of game. You are not playing the replicating game. You are playing a more interesting, perhaps, more complex game, and we are at a different level of description of living systems. And this is tremendously interesting. So uh, maybe culture is another one, maybe language was one. Uh, and those transitions are going to continue in the future. And one property of those, which is interesting, is that uh, as we go through those transitions, also more, or more of the stuff organizes together. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, uh, you would yeah. have the origin of cooperation, which yeah. is itself a transition, right? right? And in order for that to work, you need a new protocol and you need this emergence of physics uh, that emerged from having those work together. Mm -hmm. So this is a fascinating way of seeing that. A bit oversimplifying, but I think it gives you the right questions that you ask. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Uh, for instance, when you last talk about this uh, evolution of cooperation, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of uh, papers like in the game theory where they try to show all oh, the agents have an option to collaborate or not to collaborate and they have like some some return that they get and someone could say oh but if you design the simulation just so then of course that the result that you were looking for is going to appear so how do you actually like do, how do you think about and prepare uh, to do studies in these kinds of, okay, I want to observe a transition in a simulation. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky, but I, I guess yeah. it starts uh, with a simple question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are looking at this feature and you mm -hmm. pick uh, this, this feature and you pick it such that it's going to somehow change uh, through the course of time. Like we are looking at an order parameter uh, that is going to change, for example, uh, the, the way uh, things behave. And it could be, uh, it could be, for example, as simple as number of particles. Mm -hmm. Maybe the number of, the, the mere number of particles that you put in the box uh, are going to change completely the way they self-organize. Maybe from, yeah. uh, from uh, a few thousand particles, it's going to change completely the way uh, they behave. And we see that with voids, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. At, at, uh, at something like uh, 10 thousands or 100 thousands of boys. Those very simple, those are very simple navigating uh, artificial birds, right? That have very simple rules, uh, just uh, attraction, uh, repulsion and alignment, right? Three very simple rules. Uh, those have been used in movies as well. It's very fun uh, to look at. Lord uh, of the Rings has so a Lord of the Rings, boys, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and and those ones are with just these rules. If you augment the number, uh, you increase the number of birds in there. Uh, they are already going to change. They are going to form some sort of uh, niches, cities, and roads between those cities, and it's going to change completely. You you wouldn't even guess if you were an observer coming in the room that this is the same simulation. Right. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, there's these transitions, like one boy that behaves in one way, 10,000 boys behave, boys behave in a different way, and a few million boys behave in a completely different way. That's, that's right, that's right. 
And yeah, it's it's fascinating because it, this is just one parameter. This is just number, but you have mm -hmm. many others. So you can actually increase the temperature at which, which or the, the ranges at which they react. Mm -hmm. You can have give them attention. Uh, you can give them memory. Uh, so I studied a few of those, uh, those many parameters. And a few of those actually uh, help you build a cooperative society. And it's not that difficult. The, this, this is almost guaranteed to emerge over a long course of time if you are giving them the property of changing, mutating through, uh, through time. So this is actually amazing and a, and a nice positive message for society. Cooperation yeah. is actually likely. <laughs> All right, so just to finish our walk around your research field, and it was really amazing to hear all these ideas. Like, if there are some students here these that, oh, this is really cool and I want to learn more, uh, who, what would you recommend? Maybe like one or two books or one or two people to look for and get more information introductory. Yeah. Ooh. In terms of books, I think I read like science fiction because uh, it kind of drives your imagination. So uh, I could recommend, if I had to recommend one, I would say Isaac Asimov mm -hmm. uh, because uh, because of the he invented this uh, psychohistory, right? The robot psychology right. field, uh, and I think this is becoming really real now. So if you read those and uh, and you think of what it could become in science, actually they have now corresponding thing in, in our field. Understandable uh, AI, right? That, that's right. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of uh, people that you can look at. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins is hard, is uh, easy to read, I think, mm -hmm. and talks. He introduced the notion of evolvability, but all his books, uh, The Extended Phenotype, uh, many others that are really easy to read. And they talk about those same uh, emergence uh, patterns. So uh, I think those are easy. Uh, and then you can go to uh, John von Neumann, uh, <laughs> Alan Turing. Uh, those are uh, also not too hard to read uh, uh, papers. Um, yeah, that are very valuable. All right, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so now I would like to go to the second part of the interview. And I would like to ask you a little bit more about like who you are as a person, but of course related to your research. So the first th question that I would like that I ask in this is like, Let's go way back before your PhD or even in college. Can you, what was the first time that you interacted with computers? What are your first memories of working with computers? Mm. I think, I think the, the first interaction must have been, well, I had an old computer and then typed at a command line because that's what existed. <laughs> um, but the very fascinating uh, moment was when uh, there were some basic programs back mm -hmm. then uh, that responded automatically to your questions. You asked a question, and it responded in natural language. And I was like, oh, wow. this is great. And of course, it was basic. <laughs> and uh, so anything, everything had that. Like, like, I can't remember the names of them right now, but uh, even mm -hmm. MATLAB okay. had, uh, had one uh, like question answered. You, you ask why and would respond every time something different. Mm -hmm. and I think NLP was what attracted me first, mm -hmm. right? So natural language processing. Right. Mm -hmm. So something that would uh, replicate somehow what I thought was the most complex about ourselves, which is uh, a human uh, natural language. Uh, and I think it's still, uh, it's still quite true to some extent. Yeah, I really enjoy those programs. I, I think that in Emax, they have the Emax Psychiatrist that yeah, you could yeah. present there and other programs that I think the most famous one is Elisa. Elisa, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you start, started getting interested in like how computers could become maybe intelligent with the, by watching NLP. Uh, did you go actually to a computer science for your undergraduate degree or did you do your undergraduate degree or something else? No, I did. Uh, well, I was an engineering student. So uh -huh. at home it's kind of general. So I studied civil engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so really? Includes wow. thermodynamics, all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. all sorts of things, and I'm pretty happy that it was very general. Um, yeah. But then I specialize in uh, cryptography and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, more theoretical computer science. So it was very fun. What, what took you from from civil engineering to cryptography? Uh, I think it was mostly yeah. I think I was fascinated with the computer things already. Uh, mm -hmm. So so how you can make things automatic and and just 
I guess I'm easily bored as well by doing <laughs> repetitive things. So anything mm. that could automatize that, maybe it was out of laziness. Uh, but that got me to this, yeah, interest in th those Elisa kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that coupled my interest between math uh, and mm -hmm. uh, computers and uh, language. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that drove me. Wow, that's that's really cool. I, will, I want to ask you a little bit more about that. I was looking through your web page and I saw something interesting in your career that before you joined it as a researcher, you founded several like I, I would I would call them ventures or like organizations that study questions about science and technology. I found it really cool because many PhD students think of their goal as to either, okay, I will become a professor or went to our university, or I will join some big company like Google and join the research team. Can you talk a little bit about your path? Like, okay, what was it like? Why did you start forming these groups? And mm -hmm. how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, well, I guess the, the first the first organizations I founded were uh, more like companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, yeah, I did my interest kind of switched and I got more interested in science, mm -hmm. uh, especially fundamental questions. So uh, your and, initial companies that you founded were not actually towards science they were like more no, traditional were, ventures right although i was i was always driving the technology side of it mm -hmm. um but yeah it's uh i think i think there are also a uh, one example and, yeah. and academia uh, the traditional university is another example of models mm -hmm. of organizations but there are, there are so many models mm -hmm. i think that university um as we know it yeah uh, so so academia as we know it uh, is actually just one possible scenario, and and it's um, it's a very inertial one. So so it yeah. has a huge amount of uh, of inertia. Uh, the mm -hmm. the way it is is because of its goal. I think really it it preserves. It's the guardian of knowledge, right? The guardian mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, of scientific practice. Uh, so so as a guardian of knowledge, it should have the inertia. So it's almost designed to, to have this. Mm -hmm. But I think there are other organizations that can drive the exploration part better. Mm -hmm. So although universities are very explorative, uh, I think you can you can design things that are faster, especially for things like AI, mm -hmm. that now you can see papers are being published uh, much faster than the, the full uh, review cycle. Uh, I read about research on Twitter. I read about yes. uh, papers on the archive. And most papers, you know about them before uh, you go to the conference at the end of the year. Uh, so I think this shows really that for some fields, especially fields of the mind and, and uh, related to artificial intelligence, artificial life, maybe mm -hmm. uh, the pace is different. And maybe there is a better um, interaction that you can have with society, with the industry. Uh, so I think students should not give up, uh, sh should not have to focus uh, just on academia because there are other organization structure mm -hmm. uh, that, that work. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting because, of course, I am fully in academia, so I know this path and I know some friends that are industry, but also like... Uh, there are people who like form study groups and these study groups becomes like act of companies or there are people mm -hmm. that just go and do it by themselves. I think there are many different paths and it's interesting to talk to people like, how was it to follow this yeah. path? Okay. Um, let me ask you in this sense, um, what inspired you like to do this? Are there like particular people that this story inspired you oh i want to do it like this person or like i want to do it like this story what are your inspirations in that sense that guide what you want to do hmm. yeah i think i think it's good to have a to have someone in mind indeed huh? so i i really mm -hmm. like your question uh so if you picture someone um concretely it could be someone you read yeah, uh, I think I read Kant when I was small. Oh, wow. I think that that kind of drove me. But I, I mean, it's Isaac Asimov as well. And uh -huh. I think that drove me definitely. Um, so so I think those scientists, philosophers that I read definitely had a big impact. And I was and I, I, I tried this exercise through which uh, I tried to talk to them or they would give me advice in my oh. fictitious world. And, and by this dialogue, like I would. But, but that's one step. That's and I really, really like cool. uh I think it was a fun exercise, mm -hmm. uh, at the very least. And then I found out that 
by taking people that I have met that I admire. So there are a few scientists around me uh, mm -hmm. that I, I have a huge admiration for. And I just imagine what would this person say? And then I have found this other question. Uh, what, um, what is it? Like, what do I think? So if they were doing the same exercise themselves, what would they think this other person, this meta person would say, who oh. they admire? And that, uh, I mean, I don't want to do a, a infinite regress, but that was another kind of stage of, uh, of uh, like self, self counseling to, to me. And I think this is what we are missing. Uh, a lot of education, we, we are missing mentorship. Uh, so we have a lot of materials online, but we're missing this person to talk to that, that gives us advice. I think that, yeah, the, this thing of missing mentorship is like so important. I was looking at news here. Someone was saying, I think on Twitter, that 90% of a choice for a good PhD is finding a good mentor. Yeah. And that's kind of related to, to what you're saying, like not only a PhD, but even after you still need mentors to talk to you, people to talk to that. And I like you said, oh, I imagine what, a, what someone I admire would say to me and I what I, they would think that someone else would say to them, because I think many of us and myself, and I think other people also talk about it, we usually have this situation where we do this imaginary conversation as a negative thing. Oh, I should have said that to that person, or mm. I should, I would, I should have replied like this, but you, you put a positive twist on that. And I find that really, really interesting. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm a very positive, overly yeah. positive person, probably. <laughs> <laughs> what other advice, like someone is doing a PhD right now in computer science, and maybe they want to study artificial intelligence, maybe they want to study some, something else, maybe they want to study cryptography. So a more general recommendation for a graduate student, student someone who wants to work with research. In our the exploration part is very important. So I would say read a lot um, mm -hmm. and a lot of different things, different sources. Um, and I guess the other part of the exploration is try it by yourself. So I think very early on, even if you are not a coder, uh, just start coding. Mm -hmm. I, I actually give that to my students who are uh, in in uh, the humanities as well, just just, yeah. just code. And I think if you are already a coder, then you can try many many um, uh, many kind of simulations. Everything is online nowadays. You just just try it out. Uh, try to get those results. Try mm -hmm. to replicate some papers that you you are excited about. Right? Oh yeah, there was this paper by uh, wh whichever institute, uh, and oh yeah, this is exciting. Let's let's try and do it. Can I replicate it? and see how it behaves. I think this, this kind of touch, like uh, this hands-on practice is good. Many students ask me, okay, but how do I read papers? How do I find which papers I should be reading in my field? <laughs> so what, what, what do you tell to that student as an answer? So how do I find papers or, or once I have a paper, how do I read it? No, how to find the papers? How, how, do, you, how, how do you know which papers to read? Yeah, so, so I, I use this advice for myself uh, for books. And I have to adapt it for papers. But for books, it's uh, when three people, three different people recommend me a book, then I read it. I don't think about it, right? So I think it should be the same kind of uh, kind of incentive. Um, mm -hmm. So if you see from three sources that this paper is interesting, just, just then read it. Of course, if you're excited about it, then just read it. Yeah. Um, and I would say do it in three, uh, well, maybe three steps. Oh. One would be just uh, putting it on the list, mm -hmm. uh, right? And don't read it yet, right? Like, and you, you stack them, you can order them by, by priority, like this one really, or you can you know, vote them up. If you have three votes, you absolutely read it. Mm -hmm. um, then after, after that, you go into your list, you have a time in your week, um, and, and you, go, you go through them. You select those, and then uh, you, you select the top in the list, and you, you, you actually read them. And then there is actually uh, how to read them, uh, which, uh, which I think you should not read them back to back uh, at first, but you should prioritize some parts first. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's good practice. For that, I think uh, joining a reading group, there is no, no better way. Um, so you don't actually learn everything by yourself mm -hmm. the hard way, but other people, maybe more senior, are in the group and can, so, can give you advice. A reading group is really interesting because that's something that I think there is a huge cultural difference. I mean, I mean, I think many people are not actually familiar with reading group. What is a reading group for you? Well, it's very simple. Uh, so uh -huh. just a bunch of people who decide yeah. that they want to read about this topic. Mm -hmm. And then they decide about readings uh, week after week, or they can meet 
either once every two weeks, whatever it works for everyone. Um, if they are very active, maybe uh, every few days even. Um, but then they would go through the paper for that uh, before that day, and then they would discuss the paper. Uh, and I think that's the kind of pressure and also mm -hmm. self-review and how did you read it? This sharing, uh, I think is very helpful. It, it kind of replaces part of the mentorship uh, mm -hmm. that mentors don't have time to give. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's another way to kind of get that like from the collective uh, <laughs> intelligence mind. Collect and we're back to the collective <laughs> intelligence, right. right. Okay, thank you very much. I have one last question. If people really like listening to you today and want to listen more from you, like know more about your activities, where should they go? Where would you direct them to know more about your work? Uh, I guess they can Google my name uh, or uh, <laughs> I, I can give you a link. Uh, they can also uh, find Cross Labs okay. uh, on YouTube uh, and we have a series of videos that talk about my favorite topics so <laughs> fantastic i will put the link uh in the lecture page later uh yeah. but thank you and then people can go after that link to learn more about your research all right thank you very much olaf do you have thank any you, final olaf. words but before we finish our conversation uh, nothing special be happy be yourself <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much olaf and i hope you all watching this video enjoy the talk